I'm not even speaking to him. Why are you moving the camera? What? So, wait, wait, where do you want me to move it?
Um, hello, hello, hello. Oh wow, wait. Um, I'm getting. Hello? Is this... How are we doing? Okay, this still works. It still works even at this distance, very quietly. Does this sound like my real voice? Well, yeah. Thirty seconds. 
Good evening. My name is Peter Meehan. I'm the principal of St. Mark's College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for our speak by His Excellency Bishop Remy Deru, Reflections from a Second Vatican Council Father, Past, Present, and Future. A few introductory remarks about St. Mark's. Our public lectures bring together thoughtful, nuanced consideration of faith leading to understanding across a range of topics and areas of interest. This is what Pope Francis has referred to as, quote, entering into the mystery, which calls on us to listen to the silence and hear the tiny whisper amid the great silence which God speaks to us, that we may not be afraid of reality, that we not be locked into ourselves, that we not flee from what we fail to understand, that we not close our eyes to problems or deny them, that we not dismiss our questions. We are grateful for this evening's sponsors, City in Focus and the Jesuit community of Vancouver, whose generous financial support allows us to make these lectures possible by defraying costs so that we can continue to present speakers addressing topics and issues reflecting the mission of the Catholic Colleges. A few housekeeping items. Number one, the washrooms are accessed via the elevator or stairs to my left. <laughs> You're welcome. Photography, there will be opportunities for photographs uh, of our speaker at the end of this evening's talk. You're welcome to take photos from your phone, but please turn off the ringer and the flash. Please feel free to send tweets throughout the evening. I, I still laugh every time I say that, but uh, the hashtag reflects VC 2016. The format for this evening's presentation will be as follows. I will introduce our topic and our speaker. You will note that we have placed cards at your seat in order to encourage you to write questions down for Bishop Giroux to respond to during a question period at the end of his talk. At the conclusion of this evening's talk, you're invited to take a copy of Bishop Deru's new book, Remy Deru, Chronicles of a Vatican II Bishop. This is a rare memoir offering an exceptional first-hand perspective of the council from one of its fathers, as well as an insightful perspective on the many joys and challenges he faced while implementing its reform in the church in the years after the council. Bishop Deru has generously directed the donations uh, received for his book will be given to the college to support our public lectures program. So you will find donation cards and envelopes at your seats, and we are prepared to accept cash checks and credit cards. Now a brief introduction of our topic. The Second Vatican Council is generally recognized as the most significant religious event of the 20th century. While it had a global influence, it is particularly important for us as Canadians when viewed from the perspective of one of our very own participants. As we will no doubt learn this evening, the Council was the first time that a substantial number of Canadian bishops took part in an ecumenical council. Moreover, the Second Vatican Council was held at a moment when Canadian society was beginning to undergo a period of profound change and when the Canadian Church was called to an unprecedented transformation due to its changing place within this evolving culture and society. While the importance of Vatican II is undeniable, nearly 60 years since it was convoked and more than 50 years after its clothing, closing, we have yet to fully understand or measure its impact. Certainly the Council has been emphasized to us in the important pontificates of both John Paul II and Benedict XVI, who both attended its annual fall sessions between 1962 and 1965, and participated in the formulation of many of its documents and decrees. Yet it is clear that the election of Pope Francis, the first pope of the post-conciliar age who is not himself a council father, at this time we sit at the dawn of a new age, when the fruits of the council can perhaps be understood with new eyes, ears, and hearts. Vatican II was the first council on the church, and tonight's public lecture from our honored guest, a self-professed pilgrim of the Second Vatican Council, 
proposes to fill us with the hopeful and inspiring words of its pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, which are as important for the church today as they were more than 50 years ago. The joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the men and women of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts, for theirs is a community composed of people, united in Christ. They are led by the Holy Spirit in their journey to the kingdom of the Father, and they've welcomed the news of salvation, which is meant for everyone. We are pleased to have with us this evening, Bishop Remy DeRue. Bishop DeRue is the only surviving Canadian English-speaking bishop or father of the Second Vatican Council, a priest of the historic Archdiocese of St. Boniface, Manitoba, which at one point covered the entirety of the Canadian Northwest. Following his appointment as a bishop by Pope St. John XXIII on 31 October 1962, Remy DeRue was immediately summoned to the Vatican Council, already in session. I will note personally from my own historical work I'm working on a biography of a former Archbishop of Toronto, another council father, the Archbishop of Winnipeg at the time, Philip Pocock, that Bishop DeRue's appointment as a bishop in 1962 was a significant event for Archbishop Pocock, who raced back from the end of the first session of the council to preach at the, the Episcopal ordination of the young priest from Swan Lake, Manitoba having shared a great deal of time and effort working with him on numerous diocesan matters, including the resolution of the Manitoba schools question during the 1950s. Bishop DeRue was active at all four sessions of the council between 1962 and 1965, and addressed the council on four occasions, as well as submitting and or co-signing a number of other interventions at the council on a variety of topics. As Bishop of Victoria, he carried out a rich and extensive Episcopal ministry, including an active role as a member of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and being the first chairperson of the Human Rights Commission. He holds a doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical Angelicum University in Rome and is the recipient of numerous honorary degrees. I've talked enough. I'd like to welcome our guest, Bishop Remy DeRue. How's that? Is that better? Good. I knew something wasn't quite right because I wasn't getting that feedback that you normally get <laughs> from a microphone. So back to uh, a year and a half ago, April 27th, when uh, Pope Francis presided at the uh, canonization of St. John XXIII and John Paul II. Because for health reasons, I'm not to stand long periods of time, and obviously would not have been able to last through the long celebration. I had uh, rented a wheelchair, so here I was in a wheelchair. I'll spare you the details, but I ended up, after the mass was over, 
when the Pope is saying goodbye to the diplomats and so forth, in a wheelchair very close to the path where he was going to take the Pope mobile. And I saw him come around the corner, and there was an open space. So uh, I pulled out my best Italian, which I haven't used for quite some time. And I uh, stuck out my hand like this. And I said, I'm a Second Vatican Council father. He stopped in his tracks. He turned and came over to me and grabbed both of my hands. And he said, that must have been a wonderful experience. He says, oh. Oh, and you're one of the few remaining Vatican Council Fathers. What an honor t to participate in that tremendous historical event. I know he added a few words. I've forgotten the rest because I was so overwhelmed. <laughs> and then he leans over, believe it or not, and he takes my hand in both of his hands and he kisses this Vatican Council ring. Not very often you hear stories of a pope kissing a bishop's ring. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass this around to those of you who would like to have a look at the scene. And that's the ring that Pope Paul gave to all the Second Vatican Council Fathers. I mentioned uh, Francis deliberately because the connection with John the 23rd is so obvious in terms of his pastoral style and also the fact that he himself is so conscious of the importance of the Second Vatican Council. I'm trying to get this thing to, to stay up. <laughs> I'll have to ask a technician to please insist on going down. No, I'm fine. That's, that's not a problem. Can you put it down just a couple of inches so it's not blocking my seat here? Perfect. Thank you. Is that better? <laughs> okay. My presentation here tonight is not going to be a formal academic paper about my experience of Vatican II. It will be more in the form of a conversation. I'll talk for a while and try to touch on some of the key points. And then, uh, as you've already heard from Peter, we'll be open to questions and we'll stay as long as you like. So, let's begin, <coughs> pardon me, begin by saying that my contact with the Vatican Council actually predates the opening of the Council. And here's what happened. In 1959, May or June, if I remember right, the bishops of the world got a letter from John XXIII from his uh, Secretary of State indicating his intention to call a council, which, as you know, wasn't open until October the 11th and three years later. But my own Archbishop, Maurice Baudu, giant of a man, six foot four of bounding energy, himself also uh, something of a specialist in liturgy and a good historian. And he immediately grasped the significance of what was happening. I'm not saying at, at, at any depth, but certainly uh, he was very quick to respond. He called 19 of us priests and formed this in three committees relating to the former, former book of canon law. You may recall though, the, those who st studied years back the ancient Code of Canon Law had three volumes. And he put us into three committees. And we began to work on what should be presented to the council. Mind you, we didn't have the understanding we have today of the, the, the mentality of this particular council. In those days, councils were seen pretty well as they had for centuries as opportunities to condemn errors 
and to maybe uh, change orientations on a number of basic issues. They were not what we would call today a pastoral council. Vatican II is very different from all the other councils. In fact, I was saying <coughs> earlier to uh, a friend that uh, I rate the Second Vatican Council right after the Council of Jerusalem in terms of its significance for the church. Because Jerusalem, you may recall, was the first time that uh, the disciples of Jesus came together in a formal setting and asked themselves what's going to happen and where are we going. In other words, dealt with the question of the church as such. The other councils usually were more limited. They were tied up with some particular issue, like the struggle through the um, period of time when Luther had his thesis nailed to the wall and so forth. You know, that, that, that became, if you will, a, a source of, of antagonism against other, other bodies. We needn't go there, that's a whole other, whole other story. Anyway, back to uh, 59. <clears throat> so I had some preparation, and also I had the privilege of working with some of the movements that were beginning in those years before the council, because the council didn't drop out of the sky. There were already attempts, you may recall, in some of the mon monasteries, particularly the Benedictines like Salem and other places, to experiment you know, and try to make the liturgy more meaningful for the people. And a lot of religious communities, particularly religious communities of, of, of women, we're also in the foreground of, of trying to bring in a new spirit, a new, a new life. And the Canon Cardin, as he was then known, later Cardinal Cardin, whose cause incidentally is being introduced also for sanctity, is an extraordinary man. He was at that time a simple parish priest in a parish, and he noticed how the young people, particularly the young workers, were drifting away from the church. So he started to meet with them, and together they developed a method which became popular knowledge, a very common knowledge. Eventually, you've all heard of, about observe, judge, and act, the formula of what once was called Catholic action, to which since then we've added the word discernment, to begin the dimension of accountability. The uh, Jesuit fathers particularly do a lot of work in, in, in that area. Anyway, he would get young people together and he would tell them to keep a, a little diary, he had little black uh, books, keep a diary of everything that was happening in their backyard, in their neighborhood. And once a week or so, possibly on Sundays if that could be arranged, they would get together and they would read the scriptures and then compare their life experience with what was going on and what was at the time of Jesus and what was recorded also in the scriptures in the Bible of, Bible of today. Out of that developed an apostolic method which has now become generally accepted throughout the church. In fact, Cardin managed somehow to get in touch with Pius XI and Pius XII, who both recognized the lay apostolate, but always in terms of the collaboration with or the participa participation in the hierarchy of the bishops, the apostolate of the hierarchy. Today, we wouldn't any longer use that expression. In fact, with the result of, after, as a result of Vatican II, all lay people today are conscious that they are equal. We are all equal in dignity and in capacity to serve. I'm not saying that the situation is perfect, but at least there has been a reorientation in, the, in that respect. As a result, formal Catholic action as it then existed has pretty well fallen by the wayside, although it was temporarily resuscitated by a few other movements like the Christian Family Movement and others. We need not delay on that. I'm touching on this particularly, however, as an introduction, because it's important to recognize that it's already the initiatives, the working, the undertakings, and the daring, to some extent, of the lay people 
that brought about this re-examination of what was happening in the church. I'll give you an example. As chaplain of Catholic Action, where I served for a year in the diocese, I took a group of people to uh, another city <coughs> where there was a, uh, another diocese, where there was a general gathering of lay people. And a, a young man who was very active in Catholic Action got up and talked about the need to let lay people read the Bible and uh, use their vernacular language, and also the fact that uh, we should have permission, the laity that is, should also have permission to, to drink from the cup. Well, after the, he had finished his talk at the end of the evening, the bishop pulled me aside and he said, don't you ever bring that young man into my diocese again. Just to give you an idea of where we were. I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to be negative in that sense. And I, I'm not saying this in a critical sense that the people who are before us I have nothing but the greatest of respect for our forebears. My grandparents and my parents were holy people. But when I look back, they lived in, in, a, in a very different world. Uh, a cynic once said of the Roman Catholic Church, as before Vatican II, that everything was forbidden until it was obligatory. <laughs> Mind you, you know, it's a, this, there's a sense of humor there, but there's also a, a, sad, a sad reality behind that. So many permissions had to be obtained for everything. I'll give you one or more example because I don't want to go down that uh, nostalgia route or sadness, but it's, it's good to appreciate where we've been, where we've come from. I was assistant cha cha uh, chancellor in St. Boniface, and as a result, it was my job to forward a request to Rome for an indult, an indult. In those days, the bishops could hardly move without indults of all kinds, all kinds of permissions. We had a priest who was dying of throat cancer, and he couldn't swallow anything solid, not even the host. And he desperately wanted to receive the Eucharist. The bishop asked me to draw up a request which went to Rome for permission to use a straw so he could draw the precious blood out of the chalice. Guess what happened? It was turned down as inappropriate. Not worthy of the dignity of the precious blood. You see the mentality. Anyway, as I said, I, I, won't, I won't stay there. Um, so I was called, as you were reminded, to the Vatican Council. The first day I walked in, I'll never forget, it happened to be a day where some solemn decisions had to be made, and as a result, the bishops were all liturgically vested in their copes and mitres. Have any of you been to St. Peter's? You, you know, that immense space. Can you imagine what it's like to see 2,500 mitres? <laughs> yeah, it was almost like walking into heaven. <laughs> you know, when, when you think of the image we had of the bishop, you know, the bishop was a prince. You never questioned anything the bishop said or did. And I was myself brought up with that mentality. You, you genuflect it or you kiss the bishop's ring or whatever. So there'd be suddenly in the midst of this tremendous, awesome gathering, and then suddenly let me say, hey, I'm one of them. <laughs> it took a while before that sunk in that, you know, here I was. Anyway, Every morning, we had to celebrate our own Eucharist. There was no celebration yet at that time. And then get ourselves over to St. Peter's for nine o'clock, so that meant early mornings. And then there would be a celebration of the Eucharist presided over by a bishop 
of one of the many rites. As you know, there are over 20, we could argue how many, different rites in the Roman Catholic Church that is in communion with Rome. It's good to remember that while we Latins may be the largest in numbers, yet we're only one among many, many rites. And the oldest rites actually come from the Eastern Church. Don't forget, it all started in Jerusalem. And there are five patriarchates, not just the Latin patriarchate it, it centered at the Vatican, yeah. but Jerusalem, Antioch, and I'm trying to think now, the others will come back to me, a little lapse of memory here. They use completely different language, different vestments, and their ceremonies are very, very different. It was my first exposure to a bishop presiding according to the African cultures with the drums and everything. And some of the Eastern rites with their accent on the long ceremonials with many bows and triple crosses and incense and so forth. And I'm not neg negating all that. They're, they're very beautiful, but very, very different. And it's important for us to remember that with the centralization of the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, what happened was that the Italian culture began to take over the Latin and the Italian and so forth, and the, 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 the pressure towards uniformity became stronger and stronger. That had happened particularly since the first Vatican Council, a hundred years before Vatican II. And it's good to remember that the Pope John the John 23rd actually closed, formally closed the First Vatican Council before we started the Second Vatican Council. Just to make it clear, this was not a continuation. The First Vatican Council had, of course, been forced to close because of war and sedition and problems like that. So they never had an opportunity at Vatican I to really look more fully at the question of collegiality. And out of that then grew this distortion whereby the whole church became centered only on, on the pape, on the pope. As a, well, I slipped on that word because I was going to use another expression which I heard a theologian say once. We, we not only had the papacy, in charge of everything, but we also had a papology, papalology. <laughs> there was practically a worship, as it were, to the detriment of the deeper understanding of communion and collegiality. These are all some of the, the deeper issues I've touched on now that we dealt with during the council. Okay, here we are. It's nine o'clock. We have the Mass. Followed after the Mass, by the enthroning of the gospel, the beautiful illustrated and decorated gospel would be brought forward and incense and left there on a podium for the whole day to remind us bishops that what we were doing was really related to the reign of God. This was not a political assembly. So it's, Fair to say that one of the major points that really has been missed by a lot of people in their critique of Vatican II is they have not appreciated the fact that Vatican II, Vatican II was first and foremost an act of worship. So everything was done in the context of how best we can bring about the reign of God. Mind you, Vatican II focused on the church as such. First time in history, by the way, that a council asked itself the question, church, who are you? Isn't that amazing? We had 2,000 years where we just took for granted what the church, the church was there. And that's one reason why distortions had crept in. For instance, it was a long way from the beginning of the church where basically what you had 
was a gathering of disciples, all of them absolutely equal and treated as equals, with one possible exception that some were brought into positions of authority, which was necessary, so we had the laying on of the hands. But in the very early church, at the time of Christ, there was no sacramental system, nor could there be, because Christ had not yet died, had not yet risen or returned to the Godhead, and especially had not sent us the Holy Spirit, which would guide us and help us to formulate various expressions of the different needs that are required in an organization which is gradually growing and spreading around, around the world. Collegiality became a big issue at Vatican II, as you well know. But it's not the deeper issue. There's something more profound than that. <clears throat> it's the, the word synodality, if you will, or subsidiarity. It's a basic rule which up until Vatican II had not really been respected as it should. Vat Vatican II brought this to the fore, not without struggles, but brought this to the fore and it was almost unanimously accepted by all the bishops there, that the church is not a pyramid, it's a circle. That's maybe one of the most important insights of Vatican II I'll bring a few out like that because we can't go into all the detail. It'd be impossible here in one short session to talk about the whole of Vatican II. As you've already been told, there's a copy of a book I wrote a few years ago back in 1912-13 that you will all have an opportunity to, uh, to read. And uh, you'll find a lot of what I'm saying here in that, but a little more detail behind it. So you're welcome to take a copy and get the better picture. Also, um, I made a couple of, uh, made some copies of a couple of lists of some of the changes that have taken place during the council. And they'll be available afterwards. If where's, what happened to Pearl or, uh, back there somewhere. <laughs> Pearl, would you stand please sir, so everyone can see you. You can, you can get copies from Pearl if you wish. And if she hasn't got enough, we can always make photocopies. Because it's interesting to look at all the shifts that have taken place in the course of Vatican II. There are many, really, some more, more profound than others. And I just gave you a couple of the deeper issues. The question of the reclaiming of the baptismal, royal baptismal priesthood of all the laity. And I'll come back to that in a moment when you talk about the going back to the, to the sources. Let me just mention briefly, what had happened then during a typical day is that we'd have the morning of discussions and around 12.30 or one, uh, we would break and then the bishops would have the afternoon free to go back and would join the Italians and take a little siesta between one and four o'clock, but also to do their homework and to hold a lot of evening meetings. And uh, when you got involved, as I did, because of the leadership of Archbishop Udu, when you really got into the fray, it, it meant a long, hard afternoon sometimes and late into the evening, getting ready possibly for some presentation to be made the next morning. We weren't only the Catholic bishops there, as you well know. There was also a substantial contingent of people we called observers, generally representatives of other Christian churches and eventually a few people also representing the Jewish faith. And even a couple of uh, non-believers in the strict sense of the word, not strictly Christians, who had been invited by Pope John XXIII I didn't actually get an exact count, but you could find out, you could go on Google probably and find out just how many observers there were at the council. There was one particular group who was especially privileged, and those were the wives of the observers, because many of these observers were married. Of course, no Roman Catholic women were allowed 
until the third session. The observers had very special treatment, thanks to Pope uh, John XXIII, and rightly so, because uh, first of all, they had priests with them or secretaries who could translate from the Latin, so they would, and they got all the documents immediately, so they had a privileged position, and they really did a fantastic job because they helped us very frequently in the coining the proper language so that we would not offend the other Christian bodies. So some, some new words actually emerged out of Vatican II, new expressions, not necessarily new words, but new expressions that uh, showed the improving relationships, much of which is due to the goodness of our dear Pope, Pope John. I'll never forget when he died on the 3rd of June in 1963, after the first session, as you know, before the second session, a non-Catholic minister came to me, a good friend of mine, with tears in his eyes, and he said, we have lost our Pope. Isn't that something? We have lost our Pope. That was the way that Pope John had entered into the hearts of people. So you see why I'm making a connection with Francis. And when uh, Pope John XXIII addressed the gathered council fathers, he said, from now on, we must no longer use severe judgments. We must rather use the medicine of mercy. That's where it first came, was in his presentation to the Vatican Council. So Vatican Council was instilled with this insight that we must, under all circumstances, apply the medicine of mercy. You see also why I recognize in Francis a pope who has really understood that pastoral, deeper sense of the Council of Vatican II. The Council of Mercy, and this year of mercy, which we've just terminated, was an excellent opportunity, and I'm delighted with the coincidence here, an excellent opportunity to, uh, re to reconsider that whole question of whether or not we are truly merciful in all that we do, and that we not only are merciful to ourselves as well, but that we practice mercy as a profound dimension of our faith. There are three words that I'm going to use that sum up the whole of Vatican II. One is a French word, ressourcement. I've heard it, I've seen it, rather, I've seen it written in English. I'm not sure if it's good grammar, but you know what that means. It's going back to the sources. It's particularly meaningful in, in, in French because of the implications culturally to that word, ressourcement. Uh, I like you to think of a little babbling brook, a little source <laughs> springing out of a mountainside or something and running down to the ocean. Going back to our roots, going back to the sources, rediscovering where this all started. That is possibly the greatest contribution, really, of the Second Vatican Council. And it's not complete. It's, in fact, that's one of, the, one of the weaker sides of the council. It took us back to the very early church. Not far enough, really. Partly because we were still caught in a, a somewhat academic framework. And there is very little of the academic in the very early church. True, we have the fathers and mothers you know, of, of the church in some of those early centuries. But even there, there was relatively little of, of the academic. Since then, and I'm not knocking this, I'm not against it, this is the nor normal flow of history. Since then, there has been tremendous work gone, done under what, what, what we would call the title of, of theology to somehow bring all this into a body as it were, of doctrine. Thomas Aquinas, way back in the 12th, 13th century, actually tried, and from some points of view, it could say succeeded to some extent, to put the whole of Catholic teaching into 
one gathering. It's called the Summa Theologica, the fullness of, th of theology. Obviously today, no theologian would dare <laughs> to attempt such a task because theology itself is becoming more and more, more and more specialized. That, by the way, was one of the great privileges I enjoyed during the Vatican Council. Because I have my own doctorate in theology, and as a result, you know, was able to uh, be accepted, as it were, by the professional theologians as a partner, which is a very, very pleasant situation to be. And because I was the youngest of the Canadian bishops, and as a result, I had the task of being the, the gopher, you know, go for this, go for that. And one of my tasks was to invite some of the leading theologians who would speak to the Canadian bishops. We had a special gathering. Other bishops were invited too, but uh, it was for the Canadian bishops. Sunday mornings, we would uh, gather and pick up some particular point that we wanted either deepened or f further understood or explained so forth. So we got some of the leading theologians and I got to be good friends with some of them. What a wonderful experience to meet these people and to, to get to meet them as human beings, not just as brilliant minds with their big books and so forth, but as real human beings and, and see them, very, some of them very, very holy men too. I, I think of particularly, I'll mention just one, for, because he had such an extraordinary role at the council, Father Yves Congar. Some of you have read some of his stuff, I'm sure. Congar is possibly the single theologian who contributed most substantially to the council. I mean, the most substance in terms of written material. In fact, <laughs> not a little bit on the humorous side, way back some 20, 25 years before the council, he had written a book, True and False Reform, Vrai et Fausse Reform, for which he had been silenced and forbidden to do any more teaching. When he spoke to us about that whole question of re the nature of reform, in his sly way, a little smile, a little smirk on his face, he said, you know that book I wrote, True and False Revor Reform, which was uh, put on the index and for which I was silenced, he says, well, Pope John XXIII allowed me to reissue it. And he said, all I had to do was change and update the preface. <laughs> See the brilliance of that mind, here he was, 20, 25 years before the council, he was already on top of one of the big issues, the whole question of the nature, nature of, re of re reform. That's the first word, the ressourcement. And I mentioned uh, there was a weakness there. The reason being partly that we did not have any academic approach, as it were, to the very early church. And also we did not have with us, that was one of the weaknesses of the council also, any sufficient number of the outstanding biblical scholars. See, practically all the biblical scholars had been silenced in one way or another before Vatican II. As a result, some of them had been invited back by uh, Pope John XXIII, and then Pope Paul VI did the best he could, but by now it was too late to do much about it. But Pope, Pope Paul, the, Paul VI, did, what did I say? Paul VI, Paul VI succeeded John XXIII. Paul VI was very strong on symbolism. And there was one very memorable day where at the major altar in St. Peter's, Paul VI concelebrated with all these great scholars most of whom at one point had been silenced. What a way symbolically <laughs> to restore to their proper role in the church you know, these great minds. Had we had more of the really qualified biblical scholars, we could possibly have made another step back before the structured church. And then we would have a different light in which to consider where we should go in the future. Because Jesus didn't ordain anybody. Some people forget that. Nor did Jesus write the Bible in English. It's important to remember that. 
There was no sacramental system as such as we know it now with the seven sacraments. There was no formal canonical ordination as we know it today. And I'm not against that. It's all part of how the Spirit has moved us forward. But when you consider that, there's a, a door there that someday has got to be open before the structured church. When all we had in terms of leadership was the laying on of hands. Which, by the way, that's another item. Vatican II brought back the laying on of hands. Now every sacrament includes the laying on of the hands. That is the first basic sacra sacramental expression, laying on of the hands. The Holy Spirit then guided the church, and the church evolved. But since the Holy Spirit guided the church right from the beginning, nothing says that the Holy Spirit can't guide us in different ways as we look into the future. So that's as far as I'm going to go on that particular point. Let's say at this point, that's about as far as we can go. Let's, let's be careful when we talk about where we might go tomorrow to not let ourselves be trapped in what is today. Yeah. That's what lies behind that understanding of Rasursama, going back to the origin. That is why the liturgy is extremely important. Because the liturgy is one thing that has not changed. So just keep that in mind. The second point is, uh, second word is an Italian word, uh, which everybody knows now. It's become a, a, a I noticed some of you are actually st studying it. Aggiornamento, bringing up to date. Uh, it's hard to translate into English, really. It's, it's much more than updating. Aggiornamento, it's, it's, it's a whole complex of, of things that happen when we uh, try to bring up to date or to readjust or to reorient. That's why we sometimes talk about shifts that have taken place. Shifts don't bring change in the church in terms of the depths. The fundamentals remain the same. But the way we live them and the way we apply them and their significance can vary according to the different cultures. Different cultures understand things in different ways. That's why it was so important to have with us bishops from the other rites to show us that there are many other dimensions of the mystery because ultimately the church is a mystery. And uh, we here of, of the Western world, particularly of the Latin rite, are inclined to identify the totality of the church with our own rite. And that's, that's a mistake. We should rather try to get to know the other rites also and participate in them in as much as we can. And with Vatican II, that's been opened. That's another door that has been opened in such a way that we come to appreciate more fully the richness that is there in the original tradition and obviously can evolve as time goes on. That's one of the reasons why I think Vatican II is so important. See, because it's the first Kausa, I should say, well, really the second in, in a certain sense, but the first one after Jerusalem that really has opened the door to new developments. The others were generally more defensive or somewhat ideological, if you will, were, were focused on uh, rejecting a heresy or on correcting an understanding. So questions of philosophy, whatever you will. This is where much of the new life of Vatican II has come in. And I'll leave it there for now because we'll come back to that when we get into the question period. The third word is development. <clears throat> Some scholars actually referred, <coughs> pardon me, referred to Vatican II as Newman's Council. You may recall the great Cardinal Newman whose cause is also being brought up for sanctification. That will be a great day when the Newman is declared a saint. We owe an awful lot to Cardinal Newman, all the way down to uh, daily uh, hymn singing, like Lead Kindly Light. Have any of you here familiar with the, with the hymn? It's not often used in Catholic circles. I'd like to see it used a lot more. Lead kindly light, 
amid the encircling gloom. The night is dark and I am far from home. I do not ask to see the distant shores. One step enough for me. It's a magnificent, it's very rich theologically and also beautiful, beautiful. If, you, if you're not have, if it's not sung in your parish, I suggest that you see if you can bring it back. It's a very, 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 very appropriate and very beautiful. It's a very, very beautiful hymn. Um, now, where was I? Back into um, de development, yes. Newman is one of those who said things like, to grow is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. A lot of truth to that. Today, with the relatively new, recent, but still the recent discovery of evolution, and especially now with the opening up of the cosmology of the heavens, uh, we're able to understand more easily uh, some of those things when we realize that our entire universe is in a process of evolution, and the church with it. The church is not only in history, which it is, it's 2,000 years of history, not only is the church in history, but also history is in the church. Because the history of salvation is basically the history of the church. So I'll leave it there for now. It's, it's, not, it's a rather profound, tricky expression to use, but it, it's worth reflecting on. Not only is the church in history, but history is in the church. There's all that whole question of, of development. Um, I think that's about uh, it for now, just in terms of a short prissy of uh, where we're at. How are we doing time-wise? Uh, could we take a little break maybe for um, 10 minutes, have a break, just to chat a little bit with one another and get yourselves a little piece of paper and start writing questions? So let's break for 10 minutes and we'll gather again. so much. Your name? Well, I, my name is John. I was a tour guide eight years in the Vatican. Oh, so it's, it's such a, a thrill to experience. meet a council father. It's uh, what a piece of history. <laughs> what, what year did you first visit Rome? You must have been there as the young priest or did you study the Piangelo? It's fascinating to hear that from, from someone who was there, and, and uh, just incredible. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
it seems like mainly French. Maybe a French movement or a European thing. Or, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that old culture, old world. Probably, yeah. You're going to just uh, answer the question directly. You'll read the question, answer the question. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. To okay. sort them out because otherwise. Uh, yes. 
some some tend to duplicate. And yes, that makes sense. Okay. okay. Some are not real questions; they're more okay. statements. So you mentioned the year of mercy. I was in Italy. This is what the logo was in Italy. Was oh, lovely. Lovely. Yeah. But no, I appreciate your talk and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for yeah. stopping by. How are you today? So my name is Rene. Hello, and Rene. How are you? I, uh, how it happened, I read today an article. I, I don't know whether it was for yesterday or a couple of, but this uh, past week, this week, the Pope, during one of his homilies, then he mentioned to the crowds that there was an archbishop sitting there amongst them. Uh, he was 95 years old. He was, I believe he mentioned also the Vatican II, uh, Zeminski something. Well, Actions. well. Zeminski, and it was only mentioned, I would try, I called now my niece to try to find it for me. I read, I have it probably still in my computer, I can try to find it. And he mentioned he's 95 years old, and uh, then uh, after that he invited him and they, he uh, attended an audience with the Pope, private. So I said probably when he met with you and then he met with this archbishop. So probably next time when you are in Rome, you should probably send him, uh, send somebody a note, then he will be aware of your presence there. Uh, and uh, I tried to find this article. You know, do you, are, you, are you on internet? Do you use emails? Do you have email? Uh, I get it from Florence. Florence has it. Probably if I find the article, I'm going to email it to you. And also, uh, how it, also the other thing, I also scanned something about what you mentioned about the Latin rights and uh, the Eastern rights. And there was an article too in the same uh, section of this uh, when they mentioned that they want to have uh, more dialogue or something to try to unify or something. I tried to find that article too if you want to send it to you. How it happened uh, within a short while, only in the afternoon I scan, I get that the, some reports what happens in Rome, and I looked at them, I briefly, and it happened with mentioning these things. Thank you so much. Oh, with pleasure, and God bless you. God bless you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When are you leaving? Tonight? Tomorrow? No, no, tomorrow. I'm all tied up. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, hello. I've asked my associate, Pearl Gervais, to um, collect these. Were you able to sort them out a little bit? Just to avoid duplication. Oh, they're all different, good, okay. All right, <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question for Florence. Florence, is there a time limit? When when do they lock up here? Is there a time limit? <laughs> Will you call the time, please? Because I don't want to sit there looking at my watch. As far as I'm concerned, I can stay here all night. But... <laughs> all right. Okay. Um... Okay, what is one legacy of Vatican II that you would have us continue and one that has not been beneficial? There's two questions, really. All right. Uh, what's one legacy of Vatican II? The return of the cup. Extremely important. Yeah, one of the great achievements at Vatican II. You know, it almost happened at the Council of Trent. 
But, uh, oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a little genie behind this. <laughs> Apparently, the cup was almost restored at the Council of Trent, but at the last minute, a few of the bishops there panicked because they weren't prepared to admit that Luther was right. At the same time, thank you, during, uh, I'll try not to hit it. <laughs> there was a little story going around during Vatican II, I don't know if it's true or false, towards the end of the council, that uh, there were people among Lu the Lutheran observers there saying, now that Vatican II has answered Luther's questions, what are we waiting for to go home? Hmm. <laughs> But it has not happened yet. We must keep praying and struggling, struggling for that. When are we going home? The other one, um, one that has not been beneficial. Uh, I have difficulty thinking of anything of Vatican II that was not beneficial. Uh, if anything, uh, I would say that uh, the most negative thing that I found the most painful at Vatican II was the determined effort to water down collegiality and to control it. That's one of the areas where we've gone backwards since Vatican II, and we need to really work at that. Not only collegiality at the level of the bishops, but as I mentioned briefly earlier, I touched on that synodality also, or subsidiarity, meaning we should all be in a circle, all equal, and no one higher up should do what can be done equally well by someone lower down, if I may use those vertical words, just to get the, the meaning of it for and really, I hope and pray for the day when all members of the church will realize and really take seriously <clears throat> what's already found in 1 Peter 2, verses uh, 4 to 10 and uh, 315, but that also had been said way back in the, in the ancient gatherings, every single member of Christ's body through the sacrament of baptism is equal in dignity and in capacity to serve. There's a royal baptismal priesthood which is fundamental and underlies all other sacraments, all other forms of priesthood. The ordained priesthood is not the first. It's a secondary and, and don't take that in the judgmental negative sense, but in the sense that it's derivative. You can't be ordained a priest unless you're first baptized. It's as simple as that. And it's baptism which is the foundation. See, but we've come to a point now uh, through, this is the whole clericalism, and that's a long, we've got a long way to go on that one, you know. A minority exercise far too much unnecessarily you know, power that could be, and take responsibilities that could be used by others. But it's not just a question for the clergy, because it's also a question for all the laity, because too many of us, I, myself included, too many of us are too ready to depend on other people to do it, instead of taking on our own responsibility. Every one of us, regardless, ordained or not ordained, all baptized, are equally responsible for bringing about the reign of God. And I deliberately said equally responsible. That doesn't mean that there are not offices in the church which are very important because precisely of their necessity and so forth. 
I'm not against ordination as a concept. On the contrary. But we have to recognize that foundational, basic, is baptism. The result of that is that all of us are called to sanctity, to perfection, to allow ourselves to be perfected, not perfection in the moral sense of the word. None of us are perfect, and none of us ever will be from a moral perspective point of view, because we're, we're human beings. We are all sinners. And was I moved to tears when I heard Francis identify himself publicly for the first time. I am a sinner. We are all redeemed sinners. And a saint is a person who keeps on getting up. None of us have not fallen. The point is, do we get up again? But do we accept to do everything that we can? Are we willing to really be disciples in the full sense of the word? I, I read another question. Are you still teaching that contraception is accepted in the Catholic Church? Well, that's a misleading question because I don't recall when and where or how I would have said that contraception is accepted in the Catholic Church, not in the sense in which that question is, is, is raised. There is certainly a whole issue around responsible parenthood and the means through which that's going to be achieved. And I'm not going to get into that tonight. It has nothing to do with Vatican II as such, but I, I simply want to clarify that. Next question. The old guard of influential cardinals and bishops has often twisting Pope Francis' teachings to give them a conservative slant. They do not attack him directly. However, they attack his Cardinal's Committee and the other influential progressive people who extrapolate on Francis' word and actions. Is this a way of attacking him, of denigrating him, speaking with forked tongue? Will they succeed as they tried very successfully to scrap a number, some of the Vatican II reforms? My answer to that is, what's new? Given your hopes and expectations at the close of Vatican II, in one sub 60 years subsequent, what has most surprised you in a positive way and in a negative way? In a positive way, uh, not so much surprised, but delighted. The awakening of the laity like yourselves. If there's one thing that gives me hope and encourages me to keep on, it's to be able half a century later after Vatican II to come and have people like yourselves who are still prepared to listen to me prattling here, prattling away, babbling away, and are obviously interested in keeping the spirit of Vatican II alive and, and well. That's wonderful. And I just said earlier, what about looking at your responsibility in terms of, I'm not saying you're not doing it, but take a good look. How much energy are you putting into keeping Vatican II alive? And the other question was, in a negative way, what saddens me, possibly, most of all, is that uh, so many people are criticizing whatever they're criticizing for the wrong reasons. There will always be criticism. That's part of life. 
But you know, if I criticize somebody else, I'm not saying anything about that other person that really means anything. I'm saying a lot about myself. People who criticize are betraying their own problems. A loving disciple of Jesus Christ will never criticize. A disciple of Jesus will encourage. Or if there is something to be corrected, will do it in a loving, positive way. You said the liturgy is a big subject since Vatican II. Then and now we see mounting interpretations and abuses. Well, there again, you know, there are abuses all over the place. The important thing to do is to see what can be done about correcting them. But we shouldn't stop moving forward just because there are abuses. Let, let abuses be corrected. But let's not get into the attitude, which I've seen in high places, even some in the Vatican, who take advantage of a minority of abuses in certain situations to then restrict everybody else. That's not right. But it'll be there, I guess, as long as we're human beings. On the basis of what I have seen and traveled now for 50 years in many countries, all the way to China, I have never seen any quantity of significant abuses that aren't found everywhere. And that's normal, it's natural. The important thing is to try and be positive and try and be, you know, build positively. Were there any women's voices heard at Vatican II? Do you remember any specific persons if there were? There were very few women's voices heard directly. There was only one, Barbara Ward, extraordinary case. And it, it saddens me when I think this had to happen, but she had to have her talk in English rewritten in Latin and presented by a priest. But it was, everybody knew this was Barbara Ward's direct observations to the Council of Fathers. But there were a lot of very capable women who brought a lot of advice indirectly, either through bishops whom they knew, or even some cardinals, or by writing, or having some bishops actually speak for them. I know some bishops gave presentations that had been prepared by very capable women, and rightly so. No reason why it shouldn't happen. The situation began to improve slowly during the third and fourth sessions. But that's, that's one area. I guess the Vatican II simply wasn't ready yet. It still wasn't on the agenda, and I'm not saying it shouldn't have been there, but it simply wasn't. I, I have to say, you know, the, the issue of the role of women in the church did not get the treatment it should have got and would have deserved simply because we weren't, we weren't there yet. And I say that with, with, with regret. There's a lot of progress since, not enough, but it is encouraging. I'll give you a specific example. For instance, the most exciting theology that's being written now is being written by women. No question about it. And increasingly, most of the leadership being given in the church is by women. And there's some outstanding examples. I'll mention just one concrete example. The leaders of women religious in the United States are setting a worldwide example, and it's having an impact. No question about it. Yeah, but there are determined people in the Vatican who are not about to give in until they... Well, let me put it this way. Pope John XXIII was talking to one of his 
cardinals who was very, very worried and talking about some problems and they were just getting worse and worse all the time. And finally, he you know, almost broke down into tears and Pope Chad said, look, brother, he says, look, he says, uh, yes, there are very serious problems and some of them, the Holy Spirit gradually helps us to solve them. We have to be patient. But it's at the same time, we have to admit, certain problems can only be solved by funerals. <laughs> Bishop, in your opinion, and given the rate of change, which is an integral part of our world, today, do you anticipate that there will be a hundred years after Vatican II or before, or a hundred years after Vatican II before there is a Vatican III? Um, I honestly don't expect a Vatican III. Not in the sense in which councils were held in the past. Uh, first of all, you could not in today's world and in the ecumenical climate call a council ecumenical, which is basically run by the Latin Rite. No longer, That's, that won't wash. Nor should the present format be used again. It was not the best format. Uh, we weren't in a position to quarrel with it. But the idea of one bishop after another giving a little 10 minute, ten minute speech uh, no discussion, no uh, sharing except outside, yeah. and uh, no implications immediately, no action taken, you know, where that could be done. Some of the things that were said were so obvious that, you know, could have been done immediately. You didn't have, a, have to have a council for a lot of, of the issues that were, that were raised there. I'm not saying that it, they shouldn't be raised there. But there have to be other formats, other ways of reaching consensus in the totality of the Catholic Church and take it now in the broadest sense of the word. What the Vatican might do in the, in the own restricted sense of the word, that's, that's always a possibility. There may be other meetings. I really think that before we move into another experience like Vatican II, we need to begin living and applying the principle of synodality. You know, the Eastern bishops reminded us of this. They have always kept their synods. The bishop doesn't operate in the Eastern Church without the synod. It's unthinkable. And that's older than the Latin rite. Well, the First Council of Jerusalem was a synod. It's a, it was really a synod in Jerusalem. And there have been synods, at times more effective, at times less. I think slowly, much of the principle of synodality, synodality is creeping in under the guise of what we call democracy. You know, there is no democracy in the ordinary sense of the word that might make, makes right that the majority wins, you know, automatically 51% takes all. That's not, you know, that synodality is the circle and it works by consensus. That doesn't mean you don't need leadership. You still need leadership. Someone has to be there to express the consensus. And that's the role of the Bishop of Rome, you know, is to be a symbol and an agent of unity and consensus. Uh, some small, shy steps are being taken. I give credit to Francis for a gesture like bringing together a, a group of cardinals. My one regret there was that he kept them simply consultative. To me, synod means deliberation, not just consultation. Yeah. The monarchical style no longer fits the church, if ever it did. That's part of the interchange between church and culture. 
but there's no question about it that the movement towards genuine democracy, not just majority right, but genuine democracy is moving around the world, faster in the Western world than in the Eastern, but it is moving. The, the times they are are moving. So I think we need to simply encourage all forms of synodality. And that takes us right back home to our own parishes. What's happening in your parish? Do you have in your parish a group of people whose committed responsibility is to make sure that every disciple in the parish is li really living as disciples. That every person who is able to bring a gift is bringing the gift and that that is accepted and used. In other words, are all the vital forces being used? There's still far too much passivity. And of course, the big challenge, I'm gonna say it now, it was gonna come one way or the other, the big challenge is to find the language whereby we can reach the younger people. That is, for me, the biggest issue right now. Not questions of obedience and morality and all that, which are, have their place, but what's fundamentally substantial and very, very important. We have to find language whereby we can reach the younger generation. There's a few younger people here. I'm delighted there were a few more earlier. Uh, I'm very happy that we're here. But if we cannot reach the rising generation, two things. First of all, the faith cannot continue to develop. It may elsewhere, but not here. Maybe in other countries where a lot more young people, I, 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 I don't know. But let's never forget the expression of Teilhard de Chardin, which incidentally was quoted by Vatican II, but without acknowledgement. The future belongs to those who can give to the rising generations reasons for hope. That's very, very important. I'll, I'll just leave it there. Are the elements of Vatican II that Pope Francis feels should be re-emphasized for our 21st century church? You'd have to ask Pope Francis. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I accept the question. I say it's, it's, it's a very fine question. Good. Elements of Vatican II. I think that gesture when he stooped over, took my hand in both his hands and kissed the ring that Pope Paul gave me, you know, spoke volumes about his appreciation of Vatican II. Because he didn't just peck and run. <laughs> it was a devout kissing of the ring you know, and he held on to it that showed to me that, you know, Vatican II really means a lot, a lot to him. You say that Vatican II affirmed the equality of us all. Is this the reason why you no longer wear clerical garb? <laughs> Will you please comment on this? Yes, I love you, hooray, that's great. Yeah. Well, I'm delighted. This is the first time I've ever been asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted. Great. I think the sooner we get rid of the external signs that the church has two classes, upper and lower, the sooner we get rid of that, the better it'll be. There's a place for uniforms. But if somebody did ask me why I'm not wearing my Roman collar, which hasn't happened yet, <laughs> I'm ready with my answer. <laughs> I'm gonna say, if you were a soldier and you retired from the army, would you want your family to insist that you wear your uniform for the rest of your life? <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, there's a place for uniforms. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. When I go to Rome, I'll put on a Roman collar. I'm not going to needlessly offend people, but here at home, I don't wear the Roman collar, and to the credit of my brother bishops, not one has ever suggested I should. Is there a theological reason that women cannot be ordained to the priesthood? Will the second, or did the Second Vatican Council give hope that someday women could be ordained to the priesthood? Okay. Uh, first of all, this is not the real issue. Uh, this is really, I, I, with all due respect, you. This is really a, a superficial question of a variety of ministries. The deeper issue, and I raised it in Washington in 1986 at an international convention, a convention, and I ended up on the red carpet in front of Ratzinger at the time. Not a pleasant experience. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a pleasant experience, it was sad. Anyway, um, but the question I raised was, here's what I basically hope I said or remember having said, the issue of the ministries of women in the church is of such significance that it warrants discernment, communal discernment, consideration of the whole people of God, not just the hierarchy. Because it's ultimately a, a power issue. And you've heard important, significant people, or you have read somewhere that somehow the church is not empowered to ordain women and so forth. Well, that uh, makes for a nice discussion, but it forgets the fact that Jesus didn't ordain anybody. It forgets the fact that Paul, in all probability, had far more women than men working with him in ministries. And there is no question about it that the early gatherings of people in their homes like the, you know, the church, the, the domestic church, if you will. Many of those churches were obviously presided over by women. Does that mean that women should be ordained? That's another issue. Ordination, ordination first of all, I know a lot of women who wouldn't want to be ordained into the present structure, and rightly so. A great Canadian theologian, Father Jean-Marie Roger Thiard, a Dominican, born in saint pierre Miquelon, French, but worked in Ottawa all his life, died young, relatively young of cancer. He went to address, to address a gathering of uh, Episcopalian women priests in the United States. And he came back from there and he said, to me, I am broken hearted. What have they done? They've just set up another structure where women will be second rate members. Patriarchy goes much deeper than just issues of specific ordination. To me, the Vatican right now has said that the question of ordination of women is closed. So it's closed. But look at the facts. It's being discussed like never before. And in fact, what really is coming as a result of Vatican II and needs to develop even more is a reconsideration of the whole question of leadership in the church. That's the reclaiming, really, of the royal baptismal priesthood and all that that implies. And where it's going to go, I don't know. So I'm not taking a position on this issue 
it's first of all there isn't the the there's the facts aren't all in yet and we need a lot of prayer and a lot of discussion it's it's happening and i'm not this is not putting it off till manana no. we really need to look at this very seriously but it's got to involve the whole church not just one segment Anyway, that's about as far as it can go at this point. So, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm not taking position on it, but the church seems to be keeping it open, and who knows where the Holy Spirit is leading us. Let's pray sincerely for more guidance from the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Bishop Drew, as I listened to you speak, I was looking over at my colleague, Paul Burns, who's been working on a course on baptism for the last year, and, and we've been exchanging discussions of Yves Congar. I know he was smiling, wondering if you'd come in and give a guest lecture for him. So I think that'll, we'll book that one for next year. Thank you so, so much. Let me answer your question. Any group that asks me to come and talk about Vatican II and its implications, I'll be there. There you go. A true pilgrim. A few closing items. Please remember to take a copy of Bishop Drew's book on your way out. Please mark your calendars for our next major event at the college. That'll be the Mass of the Holy Spirit, celebrated by His Grace, Archbishop Miller, that will officially open our new academic year here at the Community of St. Mark's. Our next public lecture will take place on Thursday, November 3rd, when we'll be honored to present Dr. Hilmar Pabel, Professor of History at Simon Fraser University, who will be speaking on the Catholic Church on this, the eve of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, or at least Luther's role in starting it, um, as a Church of the Reformation, in his talk entitled, Why Catholics Can and Should celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Please take a flyer that indicates that event on the way out. And now we invite you to join us for coffee and conversation and to, to meet Bishop Remy on your way out. Thank you so much for being here.